Hi guys, such crime here again today. Hope you're all doing well and enjoying your day so far. Pred has referred to Vivid as an 8 Reaper, a player that does particularly well in pro 8 matches that have been going down over the last few days, but cannot seem to translate that when the real CDL matches begin as they will again at this upcoming Friday. Kenny had similar accusations the way of arguably the Minnesota Rocker guys as well, with Awakening being called into that conversation not that long ago. Can Vivid and Awakening fix this going forwards? Is it a serious concern with their playstyle? Be on to enter your thoughts in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you enjoy. Subscribe if you as always, I greatly appreciate it. First of all, an unfortunate update, but I think this has been known for some time, really, that the flank guy is, and I'm pretty sure the Optic Watch Party Boys as well, will not be going to Major One. If you guys aren't familiar with the story behind this, pretty much the YouTube deal comes into effect, and while it is possible to monetize YouTube streaming, it's not as lucrative, especially for guys like Zuma, guys like Scampaz. The Twitch streaming is, the sub revenue, the crazy ad CPMs you tend to get over there for now. That uh, Look, if you take five, six days of streaming on Twitch to go to the event and stream there and then you can't stream on Twitch at the same time just because of logistics and all this stuff. It doesn't make sense from an economic perspective. So yeah, the flank won't be going. I'm pretty sure the same applies to Optic as well. Kind of a shame, like, you know, I think the content is better in person. I was hoping to see some of the guys there, like get the whole community there type thing, but it's not going to happen this time. We will be there with a count through the watch party. So I'm hoping that we can get some pros on to talk some trash because, well, not exactly talk trash, but you know what I mean? Because that was the funny thing about the flank or the good thing about it being there in person is that um let's say the matches are over scrappy comes on sits down puts the heads on and just you know <laughs> goes rogue or whatever on the watch party that's not quite so achievable when the watch party is done remotely right so yeah unfortunate update but it is what it is and in some respects a byproduct of the cdl deal coming into place or cdl youtube deal coming into place this season now a couple of challenges bits of drama going down around the world firstly on the european side as we have said for some time, the CDL don't do anything on challenges. I mean, well done. I've said this many times before on the three pillars of the Call of Duty League logo that were meant to stand for the pros, the fans, and like the amateurs, the challenger scene. And uh, you know, you could argue that there's maybe one or two of those pillars left standing, if any at all. But because the CDL aren't hosting any challenges tournaments, other organizations have to do it themselves, such as String Esports here that put together this 1K kind of tournament here that's actually, well, understandably nasty, Bance, Beans and Hicksy got the victory and still kind of mind blowing that at least one of these guys isn't in the league somewhere. They didn't dominate the finals of this but they did win it so congratulations to those boys and um, like, I'm sure these teams will be at the Boston Major for the challenger side relatively shortly and maybe the CDL will say something at some point. The same story applies to the North American challenger side with FaZe Black putting on their own kind of challenges event over the last couple of days. Now this was going down last night. Johnny's team actually of course formerly of the Paris Legion he He's done pretty well in challenges recently. And well, of course, he famously was on that team with Jimbo, right? When Jimbo was in the Pro League, but um, they played Boston Academy last night and pretty much slammed him. I mean, a quick 3 0. Here we are on sub base. And I mean, look, Doug has eight, but uh, Craze actually has six. So Doug doesn't even, you know, he managed to avoid seven. And to be fair, one of uh, Johnny Stevens as well had nine. So it is possible on these maps. But um, yeah, Doug didn't drop the least kills in the lobby, but they did get 3 0 here. And then they went on to lose 3 2. I think to another team so not like the Boston Academy are frying there was though the main drama was around this so from Conrad tweets the following out GG's Gunless and Co won 3 nil. now um he goes to such a level of course of tweeting at all the scoreboards like massively respect this because you know some people don't like to do it or they think it's disrespectful but um look fair enough it creates a bit of drama so he basically tweeted out all the scoreboards here this is just the one that I'll share they won all the three maps but um yeah as you can see Abe, Conrad, Rep and Choco taking down pretty comfortably Gun this classic decimate and Paul X, of course, theoretically one of the top teams in challenges, at least in terms of name value alone. So they got kind of slammed here, quick 3 0. And as a result of that, there was, uh, well, this. So Logan at Methods. Now, you guys might remember the tweet that Methods said a little while ago where he said, we can probably even just quickly find it actually if we just go scroll down a little bit. He talked about Gunless, didn't he? Here we go. There are a ton of deserving players, but it's appalling to see Gunless playing in challenges, which is um, an understandable comment at the time. Now we then get, you know, Logan and saying, oh, at Z here's Gunless getting sub 3-0 by these boys. What do you think about it now? And obviously Methods had to kind of defend his opinion to some degree. You think they'd perform better in the league than Gunless, yeah? And this is a very interesting debate. And I think that I definitely understand Methods' point of view, but I can also see why Zinni was getting quite a bit of the flack here in the replies. So the point being that guy like Gunless, been in the league before, achieved a lot in the league before, and sure, maybe he's not the player now that he used to be, but it's been the same story when, you know, good players have maybe gone down to challenges and been good, but 
not exactly spectacular, but doesn't necessarily mean they aren't pro league caliber. So, you know, Parasite, of course, replies because he has other boys in challenges who he thinks to get a chance potentially over Gunless, saying the way you're framing this question and your point just makes it seem like challenges doesn't matter and your results in challenges aren't even relatively indicative of your skill against pros. True or not, kind of sad that it's even a mindset the community could have because Methods is kind of saying that, well, challenges results aren't particularly relevant. It's more important as to, you know, what player you could be in the CDL. And maybe it's true that if Gunless was to come back into the league right now, he would perform better than those guys we have just seen. But maybe that's only the case for the first, you know, couple of months or whatever until those players get up to speed. You could certainly argue that. That sure, quite often, brand new players come into the league, they struggle for a while, but once they kind of get the hang of it, they get the hang of like what the practice is like and what the pace of the play is like and how much more challenging it is being in the pro league compared to being in challenges, then, you know, they can get the hang of how things are going. But as Method says, I'm not saying it's irrelevant, but people act like Gunless can't perform at a pro team just because he's not the best in challenges. Brain dead opinion. And Haggy's like, sure, I also think there are tons of equally deserving players though that can compete at higher levels. I just think the opportunities are limited and more often than not, they're not put in over favorable ones but method is like well look there have been loads of rookies that have come in over the last couple of years like there are more and more rookies like that come in every single year with all these roster changes some of the top challengers go nuts in challenges everyone says they should be in the league and then they get dismantled and Charles here kind of makes the point that yeah some of the players coming in against like well once they've come in against more structured teams it's going to take them time to compete not about short-term results sure maybe Gunless would be better for the first you know few weeks in the pro league if he was to return than some of these other guys would that necessarily be the case over time? I don't know. And, um, you know, Method is defending him pretty hard here. I'm not hating at all on challenges. My point is that somebody like Gunners will likely perform on a decent team despite his play in challenges, which um, is probably also true. So I don't know what side of this you guys fall on, because I get Method's point of view that, to be fair, a lot of the challenges guys that have come back up to the Pro League have been new talent, right? You don't actually see all that often players like Gunless or, you know, TJ maybe or Temple, some of these big names, even Paul X, for example, we just saw that roster get a chance on a pro league team again because people seem to think oh well they're past it you know they, they've had their time type thing and people are looking for the next simp the next abeezy right we always have this conversation so i think it's nice that methods in a way is kind of you know defending the old guards that can still compete at a good level now to be fair i was hoping that that would be god or x because it was a similar story for him in a way when he was out of the league for a few years did very well in challenges and like god or x like one of the best in challenges right last year was absolutely frying especially on lan at the end of the season, although that doesn't mean the entire picture because online points are certainly important as we are seeing so far this season. But Godorex has come into this Ravens team and has been getting cooked. I mean, not only does he have low engagements, low KD, but he also has barely any hill time. So it's not looking great for him. I thought it was an interesting debate, but right at the bottom of the league, of course, are the Minnesota Rocker right now. 0-3, no points on the board as of yet. They haven't really been particularly competitive in that many of the series that they have played. And Optic have been, well, roasting them a little bit over the last couple of weeks. We saw the comment from Kenny, who said on that Game Chat episode a couple of episodes ago, that, um, oh yeah, well, there's certain players, or at least certain teams, that are nowhere near as good in matches that they tend to be in eights or even even in practice to a certain extent. So Optics practice, of course, has been continuing. We had a discussion on exactly who Kenny might have been talking about there, and apparently he also made this comment in a well, in one of their scrims over the last couple of days. But unfortunately, no screenshots from this would have been interesting to see if JP could leak a couple of more screenshots from scrims over the last couple of days. But these were the comments here from Pred. Now, I've got to say these comments are kind of funny in a way that people say that Pred plays for kills a lot, right? That's kind of his whole thing, that he's very good at getting kills. That's pretty much what he's an expert at doing. He knows when to speed up, knows when to slow down. He's going to drop good numbers. And there was questions on Surge last season, as there was with Hydra previously. Oh, this guy's running crazy numbers. They're not winning. He must just be playing for kills, right? And maybe there's something to that. But, um, you know, now Optic are winning most of the series they've played so far. That is no longer so much of a question. But after getting killed by Vivid here on a couple of different occasions, he basically says, oh, this guy's an H Reaper. He's just playing for kills. Like, um, you know, he's taking the mid. Hey, Reese's top third or P1. Yo, top third, top third, and another one top red. I'm going to pinch red, okay? He's playing for me, this f***ing kill for 8 f***ing Reaper. Top third. Top snow, top snow, Reese Vivid. The 8 Reaper. Top snow. 
So what do you guys think about this? Because there is definitely a trend or a correlation between, let's say, Vivid and Awakening as players, what they tend to do when they play eight matches, when it's just, okay, it's BPL, so this is the leaderboard so far. Draws of other ways, grinding out of his skin at the moment is actually absurd. So you put together two teams of four kind of randomized players is kind of how it works. Okay, they account for the roles to some degree, but they put together the players and um, then, you know, they run it and whoever wins, wins and gets the points on the leaderboard. Vivid and Awakening are not doing so well right now in the league but um in the last bpl splits back in december vivid and awakening were also right at the top of the list they were also like top five on the list and now the new bpl split has started draws are still number one and I don't know if I've seen anyone grind COD as much as Draza in a long time. I mean, I have to think really back to World War II to find another player that grinded as much as Draza. You know, you're looking at a BZ World War II who was like number one and number two spots on the rank play ladder at that time. And certainly Gunless back in the day. Like Gunless was known, we just talked about him, but you know, he was known for grinding scrims when they were scrimming. He would grind eights when eights were going on. And every other hour of the day, he was playing pubs unless he was sleeping, I guess. Like, that was all he would do all day. And, um, you know, he was the absolute chief grinder back at the time. But nowadays, that's definitely Draza. But just beyond that, Vivid, 10 in 4. Awakening, 8 in 4. Like, um, you know, they do well in 8, no doubt. But both of these players in the league at the moment are kind of getting fried. So exactly why is this? What is this about? Because the plays that Vivid makes there to kill Pred are, you know, there's nothing out of the ordinary about those plays. He's taking the high ground. He's cutting off the spawns. You know, maybe it's a play that you wouldn't expect somebody to make an eights because often eights is more fast paced more aggressive people just run around and play for kills type thing and it doesn't play quite the same way as a real match but the plays that Vivid made like at least as far as I'm concerned you can definitely see a player making those in a real match situation but I just think you know you know how it is you get killed by a player you get frustrated and then that kind of boils over and uh, Pred makes some of the comments that he made I don't think those individual circumstances were anything particularly outrageous maybe it was just like an overall feeling from Pred during the course of the series that um yeah this Vivid guy like he's playing like this now but good luck when we actually play you in a game. And to be fair, when Optic played Rocker, they beat them, right? Okay, they lost the search and destroy. They won all the other maps in the series, though. So, you know, they kind of have right to talk trash in a sense. But there is a general feeling that the play styles are vivid, especially because he's been good at eights for a long time and awakening maybe to a secondary degree are very good in these kind of like eights fun lobby. Okay, it's not exactly for fun. They're still playing for money at the end of the day because there's prize pool money for BPL at the end of it. But um, it's a different kind of environment than it is in a pro league game or like a real match to some degree. And it does seem like some of the players struggle more in those circumstances. So yeah, very much interested in your thoughts in the comments below. Just one final thing to close up with here for Money Hill Stats. I thought it was pretty fascinating, really. We've seen this over the last couple of days for KD, for Hill Time. This is over first buds. And again, very like teams have markedly different ideas. Kind of funny that FaZe, their hard point kind of time in the hill is actually quite compact. But in Search and Destroy, it's very clear what they do. Abizi gets the first bloods. He has almost 50% of the team's first bloods, Abizi. Selium gets no first bloods. And to be fair, it's not too dissimilar with Optic. Subliners are like really closely matched, by far the closest in the league, which I thought was interesting. But most teams do tend to have like a more cracked out SMG that goes in first. Actually, for Optic, that's Pred more so than it is Shotzi, at least so far this season. But it's a BZ, it's, you know, Fame, Joe Deceives, Capsule and Real. And somehow Accuracy has the most first bloods on Minnesota, which is probably not exactly a especially good side. But very much intrigued to your thoughts in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new. Take care, and I'll see you next time.